the opportunity to earn a living online doing something that you love and that you're mm -hmm. passionate about and that is meaningful that you would do anyway whether you were being paid or not and then having the opportunity to generate that cash flow and very easily put it into an asset class like bitcoin mm -hmm. derives a huge amount of hope i mean it's what i do yeah uh, I, it yeah. feels great um, it's very difficult not to sort of think, hmm, like this is a once in more, a lifetime. I need more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, the, and the easiest way to do that is to earn shit tons of money if that's something yeah. that's a motivator for you. Is that yeah. when you've got a community of dreamers and doers who believe dreams are worth chasing and they're doing it for that reason, that is a different me mentality than I'm being forced to learn something yeah. new and coming at it from a place of fear and scarcity. Hello, my friend, and welcome to another episode of the BU Get Paid podcast. And have I got a treat for you today? I finally managed to pin down a guy who is the best in the business at what it means to be you and get paid and live your best life in today's digital world. Now, that might sound like a big claim, so let me give you a bit more context. Stuart Ross unexpectedly changed the course of my life when he interrupted my Facebook feed in 2013, 10 years ago, almost to the day. I was lying in bed on a multi-million dollar super yacht in the North Pacific Ocean, and that's not as glamorous, glamorous as it may sound. I was doom scrolling, avoiding endless thoughts of how I could possibly continue this amazing lifestyle of traveling the world, but ideally on my terms and preferably without it requiring me to fold the toilet paper into a triangle each time my boss had made a visit to the little boys room. And I use that reference because my boss at the time was a rather strange and apparently quite unhappy billionaire man child. There's really no other way to describe him. And in short, Stuart came along and taught me everything I needed to know to create my first ever internet business and quit what I call corporate slavery within 18 months. But he also taught me that success comes from happiness and happiness doesn't come from success, which turned out to be a far more important lesson over the last 10 years, not only since meeting Stuart, but meeting his team, working with him and his business partners and other students in his very entrepreneurial community. And like I say, bizarrely, this episode is actually being published almost 10 years to the day that I first met Stuart in person. Now, Stuart and I both like to talk. This is my longest episode of the podcast to date at about 90 minutes. So if that's 90 minutes that you don't have right now, because I don't know, maybe maybe the football's on, I have put together a highlights version, which is about eight minutes long of all the best bits. And as a big fat thank you for listening, I've also put together a bunch of exclusive listener bonuses for you. It's just a load of stuff that sprung to mind as I was reflecting on my 10 years of doing business online after talking to Stu. And all of this can be found in a very easy to remember place. Head to bugetpaid.com forward slash Stuart, that's S-T-U-A-R-T, to grab it all. Tips, tools, my favorite money mindset, resources, earnings reports that I put together 10 years ago when I first got started and some exclusive free trainings. That's bugetpaid.com forward slash Stuart. Nice and easy to remember. But for now, let's crack on. I am very pleased to present to you the man, the myth, the legend, my mentor and rather lovely friend, Mr. Stuart Ross. Things. Uh, this is the first podcast I've been on in years because I just always say no. Um, and it's not I'm because flattered. I don't think it's a good outlet. It's not because I don't yeah. think it's uh, it's a good opportunity. I don't. It's, I think it's a great medium to help people to be of service to others. But I say mm. I do say no to, to most things um, because mm. otherwise I've got that tenacity that will turn me into a busy fool. Um, yeah. Oh, but, guilty. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So social but in media. In terms of though, the social media, the reason I was asking you is because the last time we were all physically together at one of your events was when you, and it really hit me, you, as part of your keynote, talked about Caroline Flack and how disgusting Facebook had become. And um, I I spend, I've, I hardly spend any time on Facebook now because you, I went, the, it broke, the straw that broke the camel's back for me was like listing furniture we were getting rid of on Marketplace because I hate throwing stuff out. 
and you couldn't even list like a piece of furniture on Facebook without someone having a problem with how much you were charging for it. I was like, do you know what? I'm done. I'm done with this shit. <laughs> but I yeah. feel like of all the platforms that are centralized now, I feel like there's hope. And I think of all of them that are out there, Twitter will get there. I don't know. It's all going to go decentralized anyway at some point. But I just feel like he's trying <laughs> to do his best with it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's an impossible challenge to try and get things right when you start talking, whether it's the argument of freedom of speech or if you're talking about hate speech, talking about human beings. I think the the most <laughs> yeah. important thing is you figure out what's the right approach for you with this technology. The problem is it's so damn addictive, as we know. Yeah. Um, I got addicted to reels in COVID. Like it, it just came out of nowhere. Like what, I was not a social media guy. I didn't spend a lot of time on these things. And then as I was spending more time inside and not going out less, which wasn't for long, long for me, by the way, because I, I went off to Dubai, but I was in Portugal mm. in lockdown one. And this is when TikTok and things, you know, really started to mm. take off. And just realized for the yeah. first time what everybody was talking about in terms of how easy it is to get addicted to this stuff. Uh, and the algorithms yeah. are only getting smarter. Um, but, you know, in terms of mm. do I think, I mean, I'm a big fan of Elon Musk. Um, quite honestly, I've, I've already got through his book twice. Um, I think there's some mm. major high level thinking, critical thinking um, that you can learn from just the way he goes about doing things. I definitely don't agree mm. with a lot of how he operates, manages, leads, certainly in some <laughs> of the stories that yeah. you hear. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I think visionaries always get a hard time because you're so far ahead in your thinking. You know, somebody on mm. the r rampage of, you know, criticizing him for wanting to get humanity to Mars won't ever understand his way of thinking because he is a visionary. No. <laughs> You know, so, yeah. yeah, I get you can argue till the cows come home, as they say, that let's focus on the problems that exist on Earth today. But if we only mm. ever did that, there would be no visionaries, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Um, mm. you, you, Time horizons. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, mm. you know, to try and sort of add perspective to social. Um, I think like the reality is is technology has done a huge amount of harm on that front um mm. uh young people's attention spans uh not just young people but at least our generation let's just say i'm 42 mm -hmm. just uh i think you're yeah. oh yes same. this week happy birthday i don't and because i don't go on facebook i don't keep up with birthdays so belated happy birthday <laughs> no no um <laughs> and i think so we we have the advantage of even just the simple things of like remembering what it was like pre-social to have something to compare against. It, um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, just the way people socialize, the way that we date, meet people, engage. Uh, I don't, I don't like to be one to cast a lot of shade and darkness and negativity when mm -hmm. I think there's also all of the other side that we can be looked at, but we also have to be very real. And so my experience with mm. social media has been a few things. One is that of, um, it doesn't matter how long I did it, uh, the idea of having a thick enough skin for it not to impact my thinking, my day, questioning things. Um, it never sort of, never went. I, it was a thing that I could start my day, all the right things, and then somebody puking on me or someone else or antagonizing yeah. or just awful things that you see can change that whole framing um yeah. so for me i am pretty pretty strict with with my time spent on it yeah fair enough well wasn't expecting to talk about that um you're presumably in portugal i'm going from your office and Indeed. i thought of something actually just a side note just whilst I was um, reading some of your, I was re-listening to a couple of calls that you've done recently, just for some recent thoughts you've had. And I looked through my email. It's just over a year, a year, 10 years to the day, almost, that I joined your membership community in 2013, the 12th of November. Yeah. Flies. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> And then I was just thinking about like 
10 years has gone like that. And you talk about this all the time has gone like that. So much has happened. I feel like we've both experienced a lot of the highs and lows of life along the way. Like I should probably frame who you are. So Stuart is my mm. first ever paid mentor, I guess, but I don't know many people in my life that I am still in touch with after 10 years these days, let alone people that I'm still paying for mentorship and part of a community and that's a topic that I think we should come back to later because there's not many communities in the online space where I think people stay that long either. Um, but you are founder of many companies in the space. You're also, Victoria's Promise is a charity, right? A foundation, charity for mm -hmm. women, yeah, charity, young women yeah. with cancer. Charity. Like, you've done a lot in your life, Stu. It's very impressive. <laughs> no. Um. But you're in Portugal and you said something to me in a message not long ago that I wanted to come back to because I think it's a common theme for f when people think of freedom. And this podcast, I've, I've only just really got super clear on the commonalities I want to come back to with guests. And it's a, the creator economy, be you get paid. It's the what's relevant now, what's freedom for people now and what opportunities are out there now because there's a hell of a lot of doom and gloom, especially if you're on social media. And you said something in a message when we were talking about Portugal. I think I sent you a clip of something that someone had said. And you said, simple, or number one rule of digital nomads, go where you're treated best. So tell me mm -hmm. why you're in Portugal with that as your framing. Because hmm. I think a lot of people, especially in the Bitcoin space, are considering it. Sure. Well, that's certainly a very nomadic term that I didn't come up with. It sort of spouted out. Mm. And it's just a good way of framing the possibilities that you have geographically. Um, you know, Portugal. So I've I've traveled most places other than South America. Uh, as you'll know, mm -hmm. I ran a lot of conferences, North America, Europe, um, Australia, uh, yeah. even Asia. I've spent time in mm -hmm. Asia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, sorry. Um, and... Uh, the more I traveled and lived in different places, New York and Miami in terms of North America, uh, I just started to find what um, suited me and my desires in terms of lifestyle best is what it would come down to. Mm -hmm. And I can for sure say different phases of life or different chapters, whatever way you want to look at it, whether I've been single, yeah. whether I've been in a long term relationship has had a big to, you know, factor around that. Um, mm. Being a single guy um, in your 30s, geographically free, financially free, gives you a lot of options. And, you know, I was exploring those options and New York and Miami served um, a period of single life in ways that I don't think anywhere else yeah. in the world would have. Um, <laughs> I met amazing, interesting people. Um, it, yeah. I was able to get a lot out of my system as a young guy, which I think was actually, you know, people joke about it, get out of your system. I think it's a very real thing for some people, um, mm -hmm. you know, just in full transparency, like dating a lot of like attractive, uh, interesting women um, brought a lot of perspective around what I wanted in my relationship life and what was important to me and what mm -hmm. was probably even more important, not important that I thought was. Uh, so it opened my mind up a lot around sort of that side. I, I had a really diverse range of friends um, when I was there. But what it came down to choosing Portugal is I wanted something that was for sure a, a sunnier climate. And I'll give perspective around this that, that might be surprising to some. So I moved out to the States and this was at a time where I was delving deep into personal development. I had morning rituals, yeah. I had, you know, uh, certain approaches to my mental health or well being in general. Um, I was trying out all of the tricks and all of the ideas. And I remember at one point, I genuinely had like a 90 minute ritual in my morning routine, you know, it, it was laid out and very, very quickly, you sort of get this rush or this feeling of like, this is really working. And then for me, anyway, it became not that fun and therefore not that sustainable um but what i would say is this is i i um 
I was living in Miami and the sun was shining on a very regular basis. I'd get up early, I'd go outside, I'd spend a lot more time outside. I'd spend a lot more time with friends outdoors. Uh, and then when I came back to the UK, it was actually because my dad was sick. It wasn't intentional to sort of move back or anything, but I came back um, and spent 18 months, nearly two years back in the UK. And I just started to notice a lot of my sort of zest and a lot of my mojo was zapped. And at first, of course, it's like you've mm. got personal things going on and I couldn't necessarily separate what was you know, dad having cancer, losing my dad, what was sort of my own mm. lack of commitment to some of these sort of morning hacks and everything. Um, and uh, I just got to the point where I I'll tell you a specific moment in time. So there was this one day, it started off in the morning and I was walking my dogs and they were off the lead. My dogs were super well behaved, weren't aggressive, don't jump up, jump up on people. And in that one walk, I had two people like basically screaming at me about my dogs not being on a leash that weren't anywhere near them. And I'm genuine when I say this, because I get it. If a dog goes and jumps up on an older person or, you know, runs in front of a bike yeah. or something. People are probably going to emotionally <laughs> react. But there was just like literally no reason in the, the woodlands in Surrey for these people to yeah. have a problem. And I was yeah. like, that is just pure misery. And then that same afternoon, I had parked my car at the supermarket in the town that I was living in. And uh, I, I was at the very end space in like a one way turning area. And instead of going right round, because I was on the very end space, I literally just reversed out so that I didn't have to do the big loop around. And some old guys banging on my window saying, you meant to go round that way. And I'm in this environment, I'm thinking, I don't remember experiencing any of this when I was living in Miami. You know, and that was just a thought it was like, mm. you know, is it is it a cultural thing? Is it a British thing? Is it a fun and misery thing? Is it what is it? Um, mm. And then I became hyper aware to sort of all of these situations walking around town and just realizing that, you know, this is actually quite miserable, <laughs> you know, as in culturally and a lot of the people that I was mixing with. And I look, I still to this day can't say exactly why it was sometimes I sort of visit friends up north or something I'm like people seem a lot friendlier here whatever you know um but uh <laughs> it's just London uh, yeah yeah so uh that you know that then led to me just immediately being like, I just want to just do something different again I want to try something different but I didn't want to go back to the states um hmm. I moved and this is where I want to get the point I want to get to I moved back to sunny climate so I was in Portugal and I swear mm -hmm. blindly, like within 30 days, it was like a total reminder of being at sort of a really high level of quality of life and well-being, outdoors, lots of walking, sunshine, mm -hmm. um, you know, waking up to blue sky. And it was just a massive humbling, if you like, in terms of how much environment can dictate the way that things are. Um, and yeah. I didn't need to meditate. I didn't need a 90 minute ritual I didn't need to overcomplicate things I was like look blue sky sunshine peace and quiet nature because I'd taken myself out of a town again it's not necessarily a UK thing so I just figured out that this is the environment that works for me and it mm. makes life so much simpler you know it, 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 I'm looking outside now it's like winter here but it's like blazing blue sky um mm -hmm. and uh if I was to go outside the sun is going to be beating down and it's just Portugal just was Europe. It was close to family, easy to travel yeah. to. Um, uh, it's safe and there's great tax benefits here. So I thought yeah. I'd finish up on that one because you know, no, that's a it's very all, I, real thing. I was nodding in agreement because uh, so much is similar where I am. And I'm actually a bit further south from the Gold Coast now. So it's a little bit quieter and yeah, just totally resonate with all of that. And you talk about quality of life so much. And I think that's what this concept that, well, one of your brands is Modern Wealthy. There will be links in the show notes. I'm promoting it every pod every podcast because I absolutely still 10 years in, like this is where you need to start if you've never started a business, let alone on or offline. Um, because you couldn't have come up with a better name in this day and age. Like I just, wealth versus getting rich. Like the previous community was Six Figure Mentors and it got a bit cringe probably towards the end once people are a bit more familiar with this whole internet marketing space or the internet mm -hmm. business space. Um, and so what does modern wealthy mean to you? Because you've just, you know, you are very well resourced. You've created a great life. I'm sure you don't need to, to shoot for huge monetary goals anymore personally, but so what is to you, what, what was behind modern wealthy? 
Yeah. So name. let's first of all meet the, that head the, on just to be like genuinely clear. Like I could not work another day. Like a lot of people ask, you know, um, are these course creators or people that are mentoring and training and teaching really made it or anything else? Look, I'm not the richest man in the world, but I could absolutely have retired three years ago, four years ago, maybe even five years ago. Um, and mm -hmm. I only say that because the question, like what is modern wealthy? Um, mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's very subjective is where I would start. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, the difference between what people's perspective is around rich and wealth is, can be very individual. The way that I would describe it is that we all have our certain life areas that are important to us. The way that we sort of get people to think about it in, in our community is health, wealth, inner self and our social life. So health being very physical, wealth being money, career, how we earn our living, mm -hmm. self being our inner self, mental health, it could be spirituality, faith, religion. Um, and then social being our relationships, our partners, our family that we're creating, building, what we do with our time, how we have fun, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, what, something I realized about me um, probably around 2012, something like that, probably around the time, actually, you came across what we were doing, is yeah. I just realized that if you were to sort of rate each of those areas out of 10, I mm -hmm. have the desire for four sevens, four eights. You know, I don't want... I'm, I'm not like obsessed around financial gain or or becoming a billionaire. Um, mm. In fact, I found that once I was making, you know, and this is not a small amount of money, but 30,000 a month, I didn't really need much more than that. Yet I had businesses that were doing seven figures a month. Um, so, you know, for me, it was a case of wealth for me is is around balance i never ever related to sort of the the hustle culture ever i never related mm. to um gary v just because of that intensity i know that's died <laughs> off a lot from some of the stuff i've seen in more recent times but you know people would uh literally um you know put this guy on a pedal stool because of this preaching around hustle 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 like do it while you're young, like forget everything else. You can worry about family and friends and, and, and lifestyle <laughs> later. It just never resonated yeah. with me. It really didn't. Um, so I think we live in times now, this is where I'd get to the crux of it is um, sadly uh, the high majority of people, and this isn't my opinion, I'll talk about that in a minute, but the high majority of people are very dissatisfied with their work lives. And of course, if you're not satisfied with your work life where we spend a lot of time a lot of reliance on it of course that's going to bleed into our personal lives uh, family structures um and uh there's this um huge amount of opportunity that exists today for us to not obey the corporate structure or the path that's been designed and built for us rather than by us. It's never been as possible as it is today for us to monetize the things that are either important to us, matter to us, we're passionate about, uh, that it could be a hobby or an interest, it could be an expertise that you know the world needs. Um, you know, there's this sort of idea quite often that um, even what I do, it's all about pursuing and following uh, or monetizing your passions. And that's not actually true for me either if I was to sort of um, relay how I feel about what I do is it's m really meaningful work and what I've discovered is that meaningful work for me keeps me and sustains me way beyond passions my passions change all the time quite honestly if you were to say to me like Stuart what are you yes. passionate about right now I'm learning motocross I've got five motorbikes on the yeah. drive right now <laughs> you know <laughs> they, they change with the wind <laughs> Um, and also, I don't always want to sort of necessarily make money from those things. It can be nice, even when you have important work, even when you love what you do, to have things that has got nothing to do with business or money. Um, yeah. I have, you know, different social circles, some that are very business entrepreneurial and I have friends that have never even thought about starting a business. And I love that. Mm. Um, mm. But the, the idea of modern wealth is, is really that's the crux of it, is you don't have to pursue the traditional path that was built or designed for you, the education system that was designed mm. around the initial sort of uh, uh, building of the industrial revolution into more of the corporate structure in more recent times. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, Gallup did this survey. It was a number of years ago now. It's probably only got worse. And 85% of employees, yeah, disengaged with their work yep. lives. And it's always the same things. Mm -hmm. It's they, they lack autonomy. 
Uh, they don't have enough freedom. Mm -hmm. um, they're not making enough money. And that is very prevalent in current times, rising cost of living, higher interest rates, uh, cost mm -hmm. of living crisis. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just thinking about young people now looking ahead, like trying to get on the property ladder, affording rents. Um, you know, the, the average first time buyer now I read in the US is over 50. <laughs> um, and then we wonder why, you know, millennials and younger generations are feeling, you know, um, disengaged with with their, their career opportunities. Um, and then there's mm -hmm. also the, the the really important one that isn't anywhere near dis enough discussed in schooling, mainstream, in family homes, which is deriving that meaning in your work. You know, feeling like what you do is important or 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 passion, you know, related or something. That that you are you. important. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, well, another... But just to put, sorry, just to put a bow on that though, modern wealthy no, is just this it. idea. It, it is the idea that you can sort of design your life your way, mm -hmm. um, whether that's more balanced, whether it's highly focused in one particular life area, because that's what you want to pursue. If you, you I've got massive respect for Olympians. I've got massive respect for, you know, uh, certain billionaires, you know, people that really want to go effectively in many respects, put a lot of their eggs, if not all of them in one basket. Um, that's mm. possible, but but the modern wealthy, the point is, is it really is a very real, realistic way uh, to create a life and business or income that you love um, without mm. it being like just sort of some romantic idea that you were born to do this thing and now that's how you've been able to make your money. Yeah. And we'll come back to the suspicion, not suspicions, the, um, the skepticism that so many people have, which I think is a lot less nowadays because it's so much more normal, especially since COVID. But another Gallup report because I read them all the time because I went through the, the coaching certification with them I haven't done a huge amount of the coaching but I do love their reports because it's data right I, I don't know if it's a marketing thing maybe but another report they put out which I was talking about with uh, a lady I had on a few episodes ago and she is a university professor who homeschools her children because she doesn't trust the mainstream education system so it's a brilliant conversation I loved her Shout out to Hippie Mum. But I went through a Gallup report with her, which was um, the loss of trust in institutions. And it's obviously mostly American focused, but I think it's the same across most Western countries. And the trust in the public school system, according to Gallup, has dropped from 1975, possibly 60, no, 75, it was at 62% trust. It's dropped to 28% as of 2022. That's a 50% drop in 50 years so to me you know part of what I guess what we fall under with with something like modern wealthy and all, all, everything you teach is this creator economy and to me and I've interviewed some of them on my podcast like it's the new school or it's the new education because people are very selective now they're like as, as long as it's not illegal to keep your kid home which it's I've got a neighbor actually who a school that popped up during COVID and they've kind of stuck their stake in the ground and said we went online and now we're staying online so mm -hmm. they're having to prove results to the government and stuff but this creator economy certainly for for adults having options to change tact I think it's it's changing for kids too like you can literally pick and choose what you want to learn and you can learn anything Mm -hmm. And you, I don't know what reports or other stuff you, you're so you've always been ahead and looking at AI and looking at trends and stuff like that. So where do you see it going? Do you see it going that direction? Well, that's, yeah, that's a whole can of worms. So I'll try and sort of pick <laughs> out some of the things that I think are most prevalent around that point. So just to reverse a little bit, I mean, the trust factor, I mean, of course, the trust is dissipating because the system isn't working. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, we cannot compare uh, the opportunities for young people or people in the workplace to three, four, five decades ago. Um, you know, when when you could get on the housing market for three to four times your income, when it was realistic for the families to be able to comfortably own a home and have one main family member at work, if that's the choice that's being made, and to um, yeah. you know have have a, a family system that, that works for you in that way. Mm. Um, and uh, the, 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 the cost of living crisis is, is so real. Inflation is very real. I speak to, um, or I've spoken to several friends just this year 
who are in jobs and careers that we were in, I was in, you know, 15 years ago, they're making the same money. <laughs> you know, in some instances, they're making less money. Um, you know, but one of the friends I spoke to, I didn't, you know, have a long conversation, but I was kind of gobsmacked. But he was like, yeah, but we don't have to work six days a week anymore. We're, we're now only working five, but still eight till seven o'clock at night, making less money. But we get, you know, it's this sort of almost, it was almost this gratitude to, to not have to work six days mm. a week. Um, but, uh, you know, we're in this situation now where AI and technology is, is very, very real. It sort of became obviously a lot more real. And I think chat GPT took everybody by surprise. Even the people that I know who are obsessed with AI and technology, um, were, were quite amazed by the possibilities mm. and the opportunities and just the, the sheer power of it, me included. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, Look, I I think we're in a very a challenging period of transition, quite honestly. But I'm generally very optimistic about where things are going, and I don't have a time frame on it. It could easily be many decades away. Um, mm -hmm. I would be confident enough to say that I feel very certain around that there's going to have to be some form of universal basic income. Uh, I can see only the big conglomerates and corporations. Um, just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and needing less humans with AI and technology advances. And so the obvious, um, you know, uh, answer to that is they're paying taxes and then that taxes, the taxes are being distributed. And, and I think realistically, even though there are quite a number of UBI schemes being trialed and tested, um, that that is, is likely going to be where we're going to end up being. Now, I was at first very sort of skeptical about it my argument being people without purpose is extremely dangerous. dangerous um, yeah. But, you know, if you actually do look at the data and you look at the studies and the places that have been trialing, um, when people are able to take the pressure off minimum wage or survival, um, and they're able to channel that creativity into anything that they find that lights them up, that they're passionate about, that they're positive about, generally speaking, human beings do make wise and good decisions a lot of bad decisions come from desperation come from poverty mm -hmm. um and you know if you can imagine you know a few decades from now um there being a system where you reach a certain age you have a certain amount of income that's guaranteed for being a human being in a in the country that you're in and you have the opportunity to express yourself it could be that you are going through some sort of educational or uh, some sort of awareness generating system if you like on how to improve, mm. you know, the world, how to maybe go back to agriculture or home farming or clearing up, uh, you know, uh, businesses that are producing plastics and coming up with your own ideas, like just taking that pressure off and giving people the opportunity to express themselves. Um, you know, because obviously the other side of the argument is people are going to drink, they're going to do drugs, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to spend their time really poorly. Yeah. Um, but that's generally based off of the fact that a lot of people have felt the need to numb themselves from the lives that they're feeling like they're being forced to live. Um, so look, there's, there's no necessarily right or wrong, but I want to start with the end in mind is in like, it, it is highly likely, and this is obviously not my versioning, but that, that they'll end up being uh, in a lot of uh, countries, universal basic income. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the schooling system, in terms of the education system, um, look, I, I still am one of those people that believe there is still value in in putting kids in a classroom. Um, mm -hmm. Do I think that, that the current curriculums and um, path options that are provided and the way that the education system is delivered is up to date? Absolutely not. Um, I just look at it through the lens of if I had a, let's just say a five-year-old right now, I would still feel reasonably positive putting my child into a classroom, socializing, learning, spending time with other kids. So I'm not like the other extreme of like, I think there's no, no value in it. No, of course. Um, what I do think is going to become more important um, is just this essence of radical responsibility it's not like there's not a lot of opportunity today it's not like there isn't a lot of opportunity 10 years ago there's actually a ton um, and for sure people you said the word earlier people's skepticism or lack of awareness um, is a big contributing factor to that uh, one of the reasons I feel my work is important is to actually help remove some of the skepticism or lack of awareness 
that people have around yeah. the ways that you can earn a living. Because I, I struggle to sort of sit here today after helping people for well over a decade make a living doing something that lights them up or something that's more important to them than maybe the shitty job that they were in. And it's not rocket science. Like, you know, making money in today's modern era um, is not like you have to go back to sort of computer science school and you have to be some sort of computer engineer. Um, you just have to figure out a message that's important to you, a message that matters, um, some sort of uh, calling that is is aligned with the, the direction that you want to take your life. Uh, so yeah. the point I would make is this, is that culturally, um, you know, systemically, I think that there needs to be more emphasis on let's take personal responsibility for our lives you know again it's if yeah. you watch the news it's so disempowering just alone mm. from the victimology aspect of it pointing fingers shouting at governments victim 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 um and look you know i, I get it that people want to watch that but it it creates victimology within the culture you know because there's so much finger pointing there's so much blaming there's so much it's out of our control well what about all of the stuff that is in our control is in your control <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's as easy as a blanket statement. I'm not like a, I'm in anything like we'll probably get onto the topic of money and Bitcoin and other things. Like I'm not like mm. orange pill to the degree that I think it's the only option. It's the only way um, I think that there's that you've got to figure out the, the, the approach that's sensible for you beyond you, your family in first instances. Um, but yeah. if, if it's cool, I'll just sort of give a high level perspective on where I think people should be putting their focus if, if that's Absolutely. helpful not the news um yeah so uh i think it, like i said this isn't rocket science it's fairly simple and i think you can start with a blank piece of paper and start in a very sort of me centric uh way rather than thinking about life purpose or thinking about mm. um, how you're going to change the world like how do you want to spend your time what does a good day look like to you? What are the things that you enjoy doing? What are the things that are important to you? What are the things that are meaningful? What are the things that you're neglecting right now? Um, set some goals, mm -hmm. you know, health goals, um, you know, financial goals, um, you know, mental health goals, like where do you want to be in your, your, your spirituality or your health, your mental health, your happiness, um, your social life, your relationships, like what are the things that are important to you? Like, and, and you have to get very real with yourself because we, again, culturally, we get into these sort of framings that I, I'll give you an example. I've had frame in mind that I don't like people, you know, because I'd heard it from people I respected. I'd heard it a million times over. And I'm like, how, how, like, how much does that suck to live a life where you don't like people? And I used to say it, like I'm an introvert. I don't really like people, but like, you know, I've moved here to Portugal um, and I've made such an effort to diversify my friendship circles, spend time with people, mm. get out my own way, um, mm. be open minded, like not always be in a rush, not always, you know, get frustrated with people because they're not my way of thinking or my pace. Um, and I've just been a lot happier, quite honestly. So I think th this is where it starts. It's like, is there sort of false beliefs? Is there things you've heard from your parents? Is there things that you've heard from the, the hustle culture that you're in, the corporate ladder you're climbing? The people, the mentors maybe that you respect. I mean, the amount of times that I would just hear something because I love that mentor, it could be a Tony Robbins statement or something, and immediately just in board, on board that way of thinking. Because it's like, mm. well, he, he, he's got a life I want. Like, I really love his work. I think he's amazing. He said it. So boom, like, that's my new belief. Um, and it, it wasn't until, I don't know, my maybe my mid thirties, I realized I was doing it. And I started to mm. sort of create more of a framework of like, everything I hear is not my truth. It's not my story. In fact, almost to the degree of it's probably bullshit, but testing things out and seeing what actually works for me. And so back to the point is when you really figure out like the life that is meaningful to you and that, that, that you want, we'd get to go through the process of growth, which is this discovery process, discovering ourselves our past lessons that we've learned, the things that are important to us. And then we get to go into development, you know, and this is the sort of essence of personal development. We get to start to try out morning routines. We get to try out new health regimes. We get to try out, hey, I'm for this next month, I'm going to, I'm not going to stay at work a minute longer than what I have to, to prove to my boss, I'm going to go home and I'm going to put my family first. Like just figuring out those types of decisions and changing your ways. And you don't necessarily have to figure it out or have all the answers overnight. Like experiment, be, as you like to say a lot, be curious. 
um, try things, experiment, and just remember that you're, you're, you're very individual as a human being. You've got to find out what works for you. Co country you want to live in, culture you want to live in, climate you want to live in. Maybe you love the snow. Like we're all so different. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then what happens is, is we get better at mastery. You know, and mastery for me is mastering what works for us. So I don't know a better way of doing that without being quite me centric, being quite focused on our own lives. Again, it's like hmm. um, I totally get the sort of whole idea of, you know, as JJ would have said, who sort of pinpointing your purpose and everything else. Um, but I think that, 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 that the, the, the right way to go about it um, is to just experiment and be very, very self-aware of, you know, the life that you want. Like for me, just some clear things that stand out. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I want four sevens, four eights. I don't, I, I'm not trying to be a 10 in anything per se. Yeah. I, I love the idea of balance. Um, mm -hmm. I don't operate well out of balance, which is one of the reasons for that. Um, if I go all in on something and start neglecting, I don't function well like that. But speak to Elon Musk, he'll tell you like, he can just be all in on entrepreneurship yeah. and business and, you know, changing the world. Um, you often hear people, you know, on the topic of money preaching the hustle culture or um, like just get your head down and, you know, chase the money, make the money. What they often don't realize is their passion is money and they're preaching to people who aren't quite so passionate about money. So they yeah. sort of see this as like this is just all you've got to do, but they spend all of their spare time on the topic of money. That's mm -hmm. something that they like to put their energy and effort into. And so, of course, it's easy for them to hustle around money and finance because that's something that's already resonating and truly engaging. I am an individual who's very interested around money, finances, mm. the future of money. Uh, I spend a lot of time listening to the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency stuff, but I don't impose that or expect Casey to be the same or have the yes. same level of enthusiasm around it. Um, so yeah. that sort of development phase and trying things out um, can only work by eradicating the old paradigm of thinking of we've got to put a label on ourselves. I mean, we're young kids, we're in school, we're never asked to reflect on who we want to be, how we want to be as a person. It's what will you be? What's that label, that title? What will you do? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and it's it's mm. a picking a career path before we even know who we are in most instances. And most of the kids, when you ask them, and if they say, I want to be a fireman or a policeman or whatever else, like ask them a few years later, and it's like, I want to be a doctor, an accountant, you know, or a, a surgeon or something that their parents may have sort of suggested would be a better career path and want to be a lawyer. Um, and very, very mm -hmm. quickly, we start to sort of think about that label and whether we go to college or university or whether we drop out or we don't. Uh, again, you can look at all the statistics of people that do university and come out of uni and don't do any of the stuff that they're learning. It doesn't mean whether it's a right or wrong decision. Um, mm -hmm. I just think that the whole systemic way of um, f we're basically carved out into this cog to fit into somebody else's machine, somebody else's dream. If you think about mm -hmm. a corporation, it started small and it grew into something big and that was somebody's dream. And what they're wanting is for these cogs to fit in. And so we go through these systems of schooling and we're literally being chiseled and carved and knocked about to fit into these other visions that aren't our own. Um, and so I think, mm. you know, why would have life been so much more straightforward and easier when we were family units, farming, um, because we would have derived a lot of meaning in our work. We would have spent a lot of time being the social people that we are in family units, which is something that inherently we value. It's what we are mm. at an animalistic level. Mm. Um, and so I think life's just got very complicated with, you know, thinking that we're connected because of technology when we're not really um, thinking that we have to sort of uh, develop ourselves and become happy by fitting into societal expectations of us within career paths and the way that we show up. Um, and I think people are just lost. And that the reason that there's such a lack of meaning in the workplace is because no matter how much personal development they do, no matter how positive their thinking is, if they're doing something that simply isn't what they're born to do, they're not meant to do, there's going to be this mm. perpetual amount of dissatisfaction. And that's why you see people jumping from one company to the other, pretty much doing the same thing, thinking it's going to get better until they eventually burn out. Um, and so once you sort of got this sort of life philosophy of like, what if purpose is a little bit more selfish? And what if 
um, I spend my time and days doing the things that really light me up and engage, guess what happens? What happens is you start to create a wake of value. You have a calling. And the reason being is because you're leading by example. Launch you is effortless for me to build because the company is built on me leading by example. All I'm doing is sharing my life philosophies, my business philosophies, the way I've got where I want to go. People drastically underestimate the value they have by just being a few steps ahead of others. Not everybody online is looking for a guru or somebody that's been around for 50 years. You know, somebody that's lost a little bit of weight that's been, you know, 250 pounds in their life and haven't had the energy to get into the first step in that has started an exercise regime is very inspirational on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, just sharing their reality. They can immediately go on and affiliate the resources they're using, the companies that they've partnered with. Um, it's just not that difficult. But the point is, is it's leading by example. The monetization is what's changed things and why I don't have a lot of um, yeah. you know, uh, I don't feel sorry for people that say there's no opportunity or it's so tough in the, yeah. the job climate because the creator economy is here. <laughs> yeah. So many things. I was just scribbling, trying to keep track of what you were saying. So that your last point there about the money, I was thinking about this when I was having my shower, I always get the best ideas in the shower when you actually do go away from the screen and the creative part of your brain switches on every time. The money thing, what I've noticed in my time, and I, I'm guilty of jumping from in this space, two years at a time, bored, but I was going to make that point. Whenever I have jumped, I've not had a problem making money because of what I learned from you and starting with learning what some might think are the boring skills of sales and marketing. It's like, we'll start any business where you can't do that and you're going to struggle. So I've stayed curious. And this 10 years later is probably the first thing I've done that I can see myself doing forever. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just my thing. Like, and it's so, it's so, it's like obvious when you look back and go, well, my thing is conversations and learning marketing taught me to have better conversations through different formats. That's all it was. And money is a conversation. So this has all kind of collapsed together. And then Bitcoin came into the, into the picture, but it's taken me 10 years to get to a point where I'm like, that's what I want to do. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm all right with that now because the thing you do first is never going to be the thing that you do forever. And it might not be the thing I do forever, but what I've noticed with the creators that I've spoken to, it, all of them have monetized later because they've led with value. One of my best friends from university blew up about five years ago and she's now doing a sold out stand up comic tour. Shout out to Sophie McCartney. I'm just going to, I'm just going to plug her. She's sold out her whole tour, but you know, she just started. I remember sitting with her on a visit home and I'd just been to my stepfather's funeral and she, we were having a gin and she, she'd been blogging and all she wanted was free makeup. And I've got to get her on at some point when she's got time. But she, you know, she's like, oh, if I get a free lipstick now and again, I'll be happy. And then she did an Ed Sheeran parody and changed the lyrics. And we had a gin and she's like, I'm tired. I, can't, I can't, I can't do a video. I can't do a video. I've just been writing. I was like, just do it. You'll be fine. Anyway, she went all in on it and sang it, wrote the lyrics, blew up. And that was five years ago. And now she's got two books, both of which have gone to the top of the Sunday Times bestseller list. She's doing a sold out stand-up comic tour I mean she's pushed herself and she's had a baby in the middle of all that like it's unreal but she was never chasing the money whereas I think some of the biggest challenges that our people come up against is like they're going in because they want the money and so the idea of putting in all this work and creating content or doing anything where it, they're not going to see that immediate reward it, it's just it's growth it's it's mm. that's the therapy right you're confronted mm. with all the things that you need to be confronted with to the point that at some point it turns around mm. um I don't know I didn't even know what my, my point is but it's these creators I'm speaking to like Lauren I spoke to last week who's she'll be out next week the advocate, and all she's done is same old story like solved her own problems and she's she's in America and she um campaigns for equal shared parenting in the States because she's with a partner who has a child from a previous relationship and they, they live a mile away and they get to see him like once a fortnight. So she's just YouTube and she's like, I just was ranting and venting about how unfair it was. And she's got 200 and something thousand followers. She's just quit her job. Um, so yeah, it's, mm. it's not chasing the money and that concept of what value can I offer? It's just so alien to people because they don't have the headspace to think or think yeah. they're allowed to. So 
what what I've come to learn because you, you've seen it I've seen it in our community I mean some people come in and make money very very quickly some people take several years mm. to sort of find their flow I don't I really don't believe that the timeline is actually that relevant um, and it goes back to full circle to what I said this is actually very simple it doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy but if you look at all of these creators that are actually monetizing their message matters to them you know that's the yeah. point is they found something that they would talk about anyway you know, and mm. this is why when you start a little bit more me centric, a little bit more, we can use the word selfish because it's a word that we can all understand. We're much more likely to find the things that matter to us. And we're much more likely yeah. to lead by example. Like, you know, so many people yeah. are trying to earn an income by fake it till they make it in anything in corporate, mm. in their businesses, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're, immediately yeah. that's going to bring up an absolute ton of imposter syndrome. You know, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't need to be that way. Like, you know, if you want to sell online business education, okay, we have affiliates that come in that are not gurus, experts or anything else. All you need to have is a belief that online business education is important and that there's people behind you that need that wake up call. It can be any area mm -hmm. of life. It can be your health. It can be relationships. It can be a particular skill that you believe is important. And so I think what holds a high majority of people back is that they don't think their message matters. Now, that can derive from a ton of things. It can be as simple as self-worth. You're never going to earn, out-earn your self-worth. You know, and, and look, financial thermostats are a very real thing as well. If you think five grand a month is a lot of money, you're imposing some sort of glass ceiling on yourself. Five grand can be one customer in some business models, one client. Yeah. I mean, you can do that every day. You know, yeah. but a lot of it comes down to our way of thinking, which again is often embedded um, at a very young age. All I remember as a kid was my parents arguing over money, quite honestly. Mm. And they were brutal mm. fights, Same. like aggressive, yeah. not physical, but like screaming, shouting. Screaming, yeah. You know, your, 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 your dad's bought these new trainers and yet you can't <laughs> even get your new school uniform, whatever else. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was uh, brutal. Yeah. Um, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. We sort of come up with all of these ideas. You look at the career paths that you're on and well, this is what this pays. And then if you get to here, you earn this. And if you get to here, you earn this. And sort of we constrain all of these ways that, um, you know, are, are putting, you know, glass ceilings, limiting beliefs. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. the, this is what I've come to for sure preach. And you know this, because I've probably preached this for 10 years. Um, we have to start with ourselves. People don't want to hear it because they're like, well, the money, when I start making the money, I'll worry about me. Mm -hmm. When I can put food on the table and I can, yeah. you know, retire my husband or get out this job that I hate, then, 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 then. And it just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. You know, in most instances, and let's remove the financial side of success uh, to one side for a moment. Um, you know, happiness does create success. It's not the other way around. There success does not create happiness. You know, I was and it's, you'd it, say that. <laughs> and it's, it's when we take a holistic approach to the mm. lives that we want, everything just gets a lot simpler, a lot easier, and money will find you a lot faster. Um, you mm. know, I've got an affiliate now in, in one of the companies um, who has just so much belief in the offering that we have mm -hmm. that their month, I'm going to say nine from scratch, month nine, mm -hmm. and they've just had their first 65,000 commission month. You know, awesome. never had, hasn't ever, ever done anything like this before, but their message matters. They have utter belief in what they're doing. They're not faking anything. It's like, you know, they've got an important message to share and they found the vehicle that's right for them to put it out there. It's another mistake that people make is like, you get these gurus, you've got to be omni marketing, you've got to do social media, you need Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you've got to do all of these things, you've got to spread yourself everywhere. Um, and it's not real. You know, um, mm. I built one of the new businesses that we launched in 2020 launch you um, from my own YouTube ad and marketing brought it to 300,000 a month from the ground up by month four. You know, <laughs> I had a message that I believe in. I went and ran ads. You know, mm -hmm. I got a great ROI, four to five to one <laughs> on my ad spend. Um, and look, I, I don't want to oversimplify or sound gross by, you know, the fact that I've been doing this for a very long time. But here is something I learned very early on in my mentorship. 
So the only reason I fell into mentorship by total accident, a friend of mine that had seen, who wasn't even a real friend, to be honest with you, we'd like connected online, he'd seen a video that I'd put out there in 2010. Uh, it was actually a video showing off an Aston Martin. Um, and he said, hey, I've got this oh, seminar those. coming up. I'm yeah. glad you grew out of that, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the UK Internet Millionaire Summit. Um, and uh, I would love for you to come and speak. You know, I'd never spoken. I'd never thought about teaching anything. I was just doing my affiliate marketing. I was selling a lot of e-cigarettes. I was selling a lot of stuff in the dating advice. I was sending a lot That's of traffic right. to match.com. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. just sort of like very early on, 18 months, two years into my online income generation. But I agreed yeah. to go along, nearly canceled on the way there. I was that nervous. I get there. I'm like, I just don't know what to do. So I just literally tell your story. Like your story is yeah. enough. So I get on stage. I'm nervous as hell. I shared my story, had nothing to sell. And then Chris is like, you know, literally I was bombarded after my talk, people asking questions. I so related to your story. And he was like, why don't you just run like a physical workshop, do a two, three day mm -hmm. workshop, put people in a room, help them out with your online business stuff. So that's what I did. And then through some emails and through some conversations, I had two workshops uh, set up one weekend after the other. Um, and here's the first thing. This is the point I want to get to because it's really important. The first thing that I witnessed is how inherently people want to over engineer and complicate everything. Because I was so new and naive to teaching, I was like, I'm just going to show them how to make this money. So, you know, landing pages, traffic, marketing, messaging, lead magnets, you know, all of the basics. And question after question, like, why are you asking this question? Like, it really hasn't got anything to do with what you need to do to make this work. Or why are you <laughs> yeah. trying to over-engineer, make this a lot more complicated? Why are you challenging me whether this is going to work or not when this is all I do? And very quickly, I just realized, yeah, some of it's skepticism and some of it can be healthy. Um, but there's just this sort of natural tendency for us to make things a lot more difficult. And I think some of that is also the belief of making money is hard, making money hard is hustle, making money yeah. has to be difficult. And so because we inherently have these beliefs, we try to make things difficult. We say this is gonna be the hardest thing that we ever do. Uh, you, you'll probably remember who I'm talking to about here, but I remember a partner of mine used to sort of come onto a webinar and say, this is gonna be the most challenging, difficult thing that you've ever done. And I was reflecting on my journey and I was thinking, <laughs> it wasn't that difficult. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that hard. And then I kind of realized that by even doing that, you're imposing that belief on your mentees. Mm. And it's like, okay, 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 this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. Well, it doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. You know, this could be the most joyful, the most interesting, the most fun, the most um, experimental, the most uh, whatever wo word you want to put to it, you can make it your reality within reason. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, 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 the over-engineering, the making things more complicated than they need to be is a big part. Self-belief, financial thermostat, uh, not believing that we're worth a certain amount, self-worth issues um, are all things that can't be undone without us working on ourselves first. Um, people don't want to hear it. People don't necessarily want to do it. They're here to learn, to make money. They're here mm. to come to the seminar and speak about how they're going to make 10 grand next month. And unfortunately, mm. unless you're ready, there's a whole bunch of work that you've got to do. And it's more undoing, it's more no's, it's more channeling your energy into very specific mm areas that you want to level up in um, every year I level yeah. up one main area in my life within that year you know so last year mm -hmm. for me it was it was very much business for me it was this year it was very much social you know next year it'll be something different but I in yeah. you know I like new year resolutions I I, I really do like, people will always say why well, start on the 1st of January it's not about starting on the 1st of January it's just like hey like gave it a really good go did I win or did I not? And honestly, the better you get at setting goals, the more no's you say, the more focused you get. Every year, you're going to level up on the things that you yeah. focus on if you don't get overly distracted. My social life this year has been amazing. I'm off to Vietnam um, in two weeks from now to go uh, through Vietnam on motorbikes, staying in little townships with the locals. Um, it's going to light me up beyond measure. But if I hadn't come into this year intentional, about that being a priority, yeah. I'd have said no to it, which is also okay. You know, so I yeah. think it's just having a lot more mental awareness, uh, self awareness, um, and perseverance yeah. to, you know, be be tunnel vision focused. 
and that exploration as well like the the fact that you're doing the motocross the different passions the staying curious and the jumping from, from there's nothing wrong with any of it but i think like that expectation of bit of making money like what one point you made earlier about um people in our generation i guess was it's, i want to be a lawyer what do you what are you going to be what are you going to do you ask kids now and they it, it's almost got worse because they'll say i want to be a youtuber and it's like mm. okay fantastic why and what what are you going to talk about what are your videos going to be about and then they just go blank because it's more about the adulation and the fame and the likes and the you know and that's a worry because and then that's that's just the product a result or a byproduct of what you're talking about because there's no self-awareness they're modeling the wrong things yeah yeah, well, I think, you know, I have two minds around that. So I think one of the the other side to that coin is that parents are so unaware on modern day opportunities, no different to before, are instilling into their kids mm. that that's only for the select few. You know, that's for the, the, the yeah. rich and famous or that's reserved for people that, you know, aren't us. So I think there, there, there's, there's two sides mm. to that. Um, what I would say is that... Um, whether it's ourselves, whether it's our kids, whether it's our friends and family is what we want to be doing is is um, inspiring. And what we want to be doing is encouraging people to go for their dreams. You know, I think in life, there's there's a very clear set of camps. There's people that believe dreams are worth chasing. And there's those that don't. I really think it's that black and white. I don't think there's that much in between. You've got a mentality of people that are go for your dreams. And they're the people I hang out with. You know, and it's not, they're not all millionaires. They're not all focused on financial. Some of them are what would be called in today's society bums that just sort of nomadically camp around the world. You know, mm. um, they, they don't have it again in sort of modern day terminology, like a pot to piss in. Um, but they're mm. way happier, <laughs> way more fulfilled than people that are in jobs that they would literally self-declare a dead end jobs or jobs they hate or like is a, a means to an end. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, life, I wouldn't say um, is, 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 Again, it's like subjective, you know, born into a country with a lot of opportunity, uh, yeah. have a certain set of advantages versus those that, that don't. I think, you know, we're all dealt our own individual circumstances. Um, we have mm. to make the best of what we've got and what we've been given. And, and one of the things I love uh, having built this community, um, success leaves clues. And I know the stuff that create success it's not where they're born it's not what their upbringing was um, and I love that it's not um, how they come in with the certain mindset but it is it is certain traits like are they open-minded um, are they willing mm. to do the work do they finish the things that they start that that they know is going to be a meaningful outcome um, you know again this idea of never quitting is a, a fallacy mm. as well because if you start something and then you're in that journey and it's like I really don't like this quit <laughs> you know <laughs> stop that's what people do for 40 years 50 years in a job is they mm. they don't finish they finish what they start but it, unfortunately it's a career that they hate <laughs> you know um so I think yeah. yeah so I think you know but but open-mindedness um the willing to do the work is of course important but above all, and this is the one, it's that radical responsibility. It's like, I have my set of circumstances that I'm in today as a result of the choices that I've made or the choice or the things that I've been dealt. The yeah. only thing that's going to make a difference between today and my future one year from now is the actions that I take myself, the responsibility I take myself. If you start an yeah. online education program and within a few days, a family member puts you off because they convince you it will never work that's on you it's your responsibility to say I've done enough work to have enough self-worth to make my own decisions that my partner it could be my spouse my friend my mum who's mm -hmm. projectile vomiting their views mm -hmm. it's not going to impact my decision you know yeah. people are very easily uh, persuaded to do the things that other people's agendas or views of the world um, and that's again why it yeah. comes back to doing the inner inner work yeah very quickly the um the hard that they're trying to escape is less hard than the hard of doing something new what is it tony robbins says it's when the the pain of staying the pain of change needs mm. to be less mm. than the pain of staying the same and it's so people forget so quickly why they start it's infuriating yeah. and i heard you say something on an interview recently i think it popped up on youtube 
to one of you were out you had a few of the um, members in Portugal and you said there's nothing worse than wanting for wanting something for someone more than they want it themselves and mm -hmm. it's that is that has been probably the story of my last 10 years because the minute you start doing something you can't understand why other people wouldn't want to do the same and if yeah. you're a, a bit of a fixer, which I absolutely am, that's been my my inner work has been like how I can't I need to be more selfish. I'm still I'm still letting go of that. It's painful. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, the thing that what, what might thing help you with that, that sort of mindset or even the philosophy around that is selfishness does lead to leading by example. And there will come a time where that leading by example is far more impactful than mm -hmm. anything else that you could do because yeah. you're a genuine leader, you are demonstrating and walking the walk, you know? So, you know, as an example in today's sort of creator economy, um, you know, you get your blank piece of paper and you write down the things that you want in your life and you start going mm -hmm. and getting those. Look, the first thing is it's gonna be inspiring for your friends and family around you, whether they tell you or not is different. Yep. But hang on a minute, yep. have you seen that they've got a spring in their step? Have you seen she's, yeah. she's consistently going to the gym? Have you seen that, yeah. like just the way that she shows up in her attitude and her aura is different. Like people yeah. see that change. And then, you know, the, the challenging thing is that quite often that causes people to look in the mirror and then project onto you their insecurities, their fears, their anxieties, their mm -hmm. lack of self-worth. Self and if you're not strong enough in many respects, if you're not willing to persevere through that, that can be enough to say, oh, I want to stay small. I, I want to be mm -hmm. accepted. I want to be, yeah. I want to have a go out and binge drink at the weekends because of the banter that they say I'm boring if I don't make that choice, you know? And so it's very easy to sort of get pulled back into that environment in the early stages. But the minute you start to accelerate, which is what happens, and you start mm. to realize that, hang on, I'm really creating, self-creating the life that is mm. serving me, you then magnetically attract the friends, uh, some will level up with you, some will disappear, you'll attract new friends. My, my friend circle, I would say is like 70, 30, like is in 30% is like my long standing long friends. Standing, and like 70% yeah. is like completely mm -hmm. new. And that 70% yep. of friends that I've attracted, I probably spend the most time with because they are people that have come into my life at this phase, at this stage. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, life just, for me anyway, has just got better and better and better embodying this idea of like, what if like a meaningful mission is just a, a focusing on my current life purpose of doing the things that light me up? Maybe it's starting a family. Uh, maybe yeah. it's, you know, nurturing and spending time with that family. Maybe it's, you know, spending more time doing that hobby or pursuing that sport that you love that you let go mm. because of the working hours or whatever else it is. And is the more you start um, that, the more obvious it is that I can monetize this. Like there's, yeah. there's, there's a whole, out of the 10 things in my day that are important to me, these are two things that I would love to monetize. You know, I'd mm. love to start selling products online that solve this particular problem because I cook and, you know, I hate this sort of crap plastic cookware but this stuff mm. is really awesome hey maybe there's some skills that i could learn to actually create a brand on shopify or amazon that can be my color scheme and can be my types of materials that i can source yeah. and, and 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 i'm going to spend even more time in the kitchen like the ideas will just be so prevalent because you are embodying mm. the life you want people forget people say all the time i don't know what my passions are and it's not <laughs> because they're broken it's because it's been so long that they've lived passionately if you do anything long enough you're going to forget what it feels like if you don't love for long enough, if you if you uh, aren't passionate, if you don't have hobbies, if you don't spend time socializing, you're going to forget mm -hmm. what those things even have to offer. And so it, it will at yeah. first feel a bit alien. People have looked at me in the eyes. I still I have no passions. That's OK. <laughs> That's OK. You need to go back to the blank piece of paper and just what do you, do you enjoy walking? No. Do you enjoy running? No. Do you enjoy cycling? Actually, I do quite enjoy cycling. Start cycling more. <laughs> you know it's, it's yeah. really that simple do it anyway yeah yeah do it do it now well we, we've done the same thing and it, you mentioned on another call that you've got a friend on the gold coast who's just decided to move into a catamaran yes yeah um that's like my partner's life dream is to get a catamaran he would buy one now so we didn't have to pay rent if he had his way and 
sail around the world. We follow um, Sailing La Vagabond on YouTube. They've got well over a million subscribers. Do you know them? Have you seen them? I've, I know that brand. Yeah, I do know that brand. They're I, amazing. They say, they, yeah. Yeah. And they've they've built massive creator business. Um, I mean, they got into YouTube pretty early, but again, like w- what it can become, it's it, mammoth what they're doing. Um, but changing gears slightly into uh, community. So when you were you were talking about radical responsibility, since getting into Bitcoin, the Bitcoin space, it's something I found myself getting very passionate about. And I was like, hmm does this need to become part of my brand? And I, I definitely want to bring more awareness to it. And I think particularly as a female as well, there's not that many female voices in the space. So, so much of what you've said, community, like your community, when I found it, it, it was the first time I'd ever felt like, oh, these are my people. And I speak to so many Bitcoiners now that are like, that is a very similar space where people are just so behind this mission that everyone's trying to move forward. But so many people as well that I see in the space are so passionate about Bitcoin that it's going to become this thing that makes them rich, that in the meantime, they're doing all the things that you've been talking about. And that's kind of where I'm trying to join these dots for people. It's like, we don't know how long it's going to take for this thing to make you rich. And what are you going to, if it's 10 years, your kids will have left home. So all the things that you're saying you want to be rich for won't be the same in 10 years time. That's a whole conversation has been touching on how your, your life changes and where you're at now. But when it when it comes to community as well, that's such a core piece of building any brand, right? So the outdoor space is something my partner's very passionate about. And I keep saving all these Instagram feeds I'm spotting of, of families that have built half a million followers around going into the outdoors with, with their kids. And so speak into, into the importance of community. I mean, you've already touched on having people behind you, but when it comes to actually marketing something or or having a message that matters, like how much that sort of snowball effect kicks in when you realize you found your people. For sure. So, I mean, I would say by far the most important thing, this goes full circle to being in community or communities Mm. is again, it's environment. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you are much more likely going to become, you know, the power of the the beliefs and the ideas and the way that people operate. Like if you were to say, you know, what's the biggest benefit of the Launch You community is it's a community of people that do believe dreams are worth chasing. You know, so if you're around a community of people that have that belief and are willing to do the work to do it, how much easier and encouraging is it for you to be in that environment? Um, no different to mm-hmm. when I moved back to Portugal and the sun was out and the sky was blue. Like it yeah. was much more effortlessly uh, for me to get up in a great mood, to feel energized, <laughs> to feel good. Like I didn't have yeah. to do any sort of tricks or hacks. It's like that environment alone shifted it. And so, yeah. you know, you want to look for um, the right communities that are aligned with the things that are important and matter to you. Like if I was to reel off mm. um, different communities I'm a part of, uh, or, or see myself being a part of. It's not just the communities that I've built. Um, it's Facebook groups. It's it's friendship circles. Um, mm. It's WhatsApp groups that I'm part of. Um, you know, I have like one group that is like the most entertaining. It brings me so much value on that front. And it's a lads mm. like shit talking group where we just <laughs> shit talk each other all day with gifts and images. Um, and, and it's hilarious. And it's like, it's, it's yeah. like brings so much joy to my day like, when really? I see the gift come yeah. through. And even if it's aimed at me. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just, I think that that's the key is it's, it's removing yourself. If you're a particular corporate culture and you're going to work every day and you're surrounded by people that you haven't chosen to be around and they don't mm. adopt or have the types of beliefs or values that you have, you're going to be pretty negative in that environment. It's not going to be very helpful. Um, so I think, you know, community, (laughs) community is often seen as this weird cult like, uh, idea, but it's just, just try and remove any weirdness from it and look at it through the lens of it's simply surrounding yourself, uh, by people that have similar ideas and beliefs that you have. When, when the team said to me, you know, what's the most important thing culturally with the launch you group. And it's, for me, it's like, they believe dreams are worth chasing. It's not they want digital skills. It's not they believe online business yeah. is the answer. It's, it's simply a value of that, that, hey, like, I don't think that I'm stuck in my current way. I, I don't think it's too good to be true. The idea of being able to travel the world and make a great living and have a positive impact. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I do believe that 
um, the leadership in this organization uh, can help me uh, achieve the dreams that I have because they're not too mm. skeptical to think, why would anybody do this type of business? It must just be a money scheme. Like, you know, you've know, you got to sort of be very strong and clear in terms of the hierarchy of your values because that's what's going to allow you to attract your tribe, if you like. Yeah, not be a victim. Amazing. So we've got, we've got to touch on Bitcoin because I know that a lot of people that listen to this podcast so far, I think, are existing Bitcoiners. When did you find it? And I know you said you've always been interested in money and finance um, and you've been you've told me you've had you've been fortunate enough to have financial mentors around. And that was something that I guess for obvious reasons now you don't focus so much on in, in your community because everyone's it's subjective. We're trying to achieve a different mission. But what I've learned from being down this Bitcoin rabbit hole for two years since the pandemic hit and I just sort of shut down and went, I don't want to be on the Internet. I don't want to talk to people and what I've discovered and having to change my mind about things. So when did you discover it and start? Because you've told me, I don't want anything else. That's all I'm investing in, which may not be the case, but you seem quite passionate about it as well. Um, well, I first sort of read and heard about Bitcoin maybe 2014 or 15, but very Ooh. vague and very much thought it was an internet money scam. Um, Silly thing. I even remember the bull market in 2017 when it was on the news, thinking it was just a bubble and it would go to zero. Yeah. Um, it was the bottom of the bear market after that 17 top. Mm -hmm. or, or Bitcoin was, or, I don't know the timing, but it, I can tell you the price was about three and a half thousand dollars, something like that. So you hadn't bought any um, during that bull market? No. No, no. Nice. In fact, you know, we had community members that had been in some of these sort of money Bitcoin related schemes and, you know, they'd mm. gone to zero and people had lost loads of money. So you just sort of put it all, lump it all into one basket like a lot of people do yes. now. You know, Bitcoin yeah. is crypto. Crypto is Bitcoin. Like it's mm. like um, the, the, yeah. I had a very vague uh, understanding of it and lumped it in, you know, the same as everything else that was falling mm. by the wayside. Uh, I think I was in South Africa and I believe that I just randomly was listening to uh, a YouTube podcast or, or video or interview or something and started to understand, um, I guess you could say, the technology and the philosophy behind Bitcoin. You know, mm. um, I've never, by the way, read the white paper or anything. I've watched videos that sort of break it down, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, started to just I, I'd already, you know, had a good amount of awareness of where the money system was broken. I learned a fair amount yeah. around, you know, printing, quantitative easing, um, mm -hmm. inflation. Um, was very already at that point, 2018, let's say, skeptical around um, where to put money. Um, <laughs> you know, I guess you could say the baby boomer generation property was just so obvious. You know, prices yeah. constantly going up, not that difficult to get on the ladder, not that difficult to remortgage, not that difficult. And then it then they became 100% mortgages and really good buy to let Cheap deals debt. and every month you couldn't mm. go wrong. And I just remember in sort of 18 thinking this is not going to sustain like it is just simply not possible. I mean, it, like three times earnings, five times earnings, seven times earnings, nine times earnings. Like, they, you know, now in the UK, they're sort of wanting to do 50 year mortgages, which I think might have even just been approved. Um, and I just, you know, having been an estate agent for eight years, um, didn't believe that that was the right vehicle for me. And I wanted to find mm. what the alternative was. And I was already sort of delving deep into stocks and learning about um, ETFs and that type of stuff. Um, and then I was looking at gold and Bitcoin um, around the same time. And I was thinking just logically at a high level, like where are millennials going to want to put their money? Like something that's like nine times their earnings, something that's not sustainable, something that's not that liquid um, or something that is, you know, virtual property in the cyberspace where there's a limited supply that is so liquid that I can put millions in my wallet, get on a plane, head over to Australia, you know, release that liquidity at any level, any amount within seconds for mm. virtually no cost. I was very much already delving into blockchain, understanding around what decentralization was at that time, how it would deal with security, um, transparency, trust factors, the banking system. Um, so yeah, that with the accessibility, low transaction fees, 
being aware on, you know, blockchain projects, uh, decentralized projects, the future of tech, it was just so became just so damn obvious that mm. this is going to be uh, a contender. And I still do look at it as a hedge against inflation. There's obviously all different debates and how it's following the stock market and everything else. My my view is this, is that it's been outside of property, near on impossible to sensibly have an incentive to put your money anywhere for the average person earning, working hard, earning an income. Like, where do you put your money and hedge mm. against inflation? Like, you can't save, you know, is it even safe in the bank? You know, again, I don't want to get all sort of tinfoil hat here, but um, we are seeing banks collapsing around us. I do remember when Northern Rock went down, you know, back in 08 yeah. or 09. It was the first time in, in our time that something like that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, just just sort of really um, understanding the ownership, the control. Um, and then it is a genuine, as far as I'm concerned, it's the opportunity of a lifetime at the timing that we have right now. Every, you know, few decades, there's something comes along. And like I say, it was property. Um, it has been the stock market. Um, and I think that Bitcoin fixes just so many of the problems. But but again, without getting into losing probably the mass majority of the audience, although I think your audience is much more, you know, familiar with with blockchain and Bitcoin, but just for the average listener, um, like we should be able to earn our income and put it somewhere that's going to return um, a decent yield without having to get a mortgage or without having to learn how to be a day trader um, or ha- without having to carry and take on loads of risk. And so like, it's just so obvious that this thing that has now been entirely proven in terms of its technology, security, mm-hmm. safety, um, mm-hmm. you know, yes, there's still the tinfoil arguments around, well, what if it carries on after 21 million, all the other stuff that you hear. Um, and of course, there's always going to be those for the rest of time. I just mm-hmm. don't think there's a better opportunity uh, or a better place to be able to sort of siphon off money for the average person. Uh, and again, the liquidity is a big part of that because, you know, I've got a lot of experience from the career I was in before of people that were wealthy on paper. Yeah. But anytime they needed the money, they couldn't access the bloody stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it could be something as urgent as like having to borrow money to help with, you know, some sort of medical issue. Yeah. Um, and going That's having to one. figure out all the paperwork or ask for it. Whereas like, mm-hmm. you know, Bitcoin is just liquid. Um, it's yeah. scarce. Um, it's limited mm-hmm. in supply. Um, it solves the problem mm-hmm. of, you know, quantitative easing. I mean, it's, it's, there's not many things that it doesn't fix. Yeah. Oh, and and, I, and everything we've had a conversation about, I'm so glad you summed it up that way because everything we were talking about earlier with people being stuck in jobs they hate because they're trapped into a paycheck because cost of living is where it's at like it's that it starts with the money and this is why I've got so passionate about it because all the values that underlie Bitcoin and the philosophy and everything that went into designing it and all the which has taken hundreds of hours of work um it's there's these underlying values like the proof of work concept when that dropped for me the fact that it's it's taking energy and turning it into something of value it's like that's everything you've just talked about it's basically mm-hmm. money designed on human values that's fair. Yeah. And I think that's why I got so passionate about it so quickly when that dropped for me, because I'm like, this is everything I've been learning already for 10 years. Like this, this, yeah. this is the money we, we should be using with those values in mind because it levels the playing field. Yeah, no, it was um, similar for me. Um, I mean, I started buying, so I think it was 2018. I've, I've, yeah. I have sold some Bitcoin, actually. I sold fairly close towards the top, around sort of 60K. Um, didn't mm-hmm. quite make the top, but um, I was just sort of dollar cost averaging out at that time because I thought it was yes. a sensible thing to do, but I didn't sell a lot. And then I just mm-hmm. only started buying again quite recently. I just left everything yeah. that I had, including a lot of other sort of uh, projects that I have some belief in. I own a bunch of products that I've not kept up to date with, but I just think, you know, the money's in them, just see what happens. Um, yeah. I'm not like, I'm not like, um, one of those people that only believes bitcoin um i think there's Mm. other projects that look interesting um what what i would say i just think there's an important point that i'd like to say is um i think that uh 
the opportunity to earn a living online doing something that you love and that you're mm -hmm. passionate about and that is meaningful that you would do anyway whether you were being paid or not and then having the opportunity to generate that cash flow and very easily put it into an asset class like bitcoin mm -hmm. derives a huge amount of hope i mean it's what i do yeah uh, it, it yeah. feels great um you know I, I know a lot of people that have utter belief in Bitcoin, but their whole reliance on money is Bitcoin. And I think one of the problems I see with that is that because we can't control the price, yeah. um, it's very difficult not to get drawn in or emotionally involved with all the ups and downs and the volatility. And it's quite challenging. Um, there are going to be yes, people it is. That, <laughs> yeah, that, that, so there are going to be people um, that are fine with that, especially when you've been through a few cycles. But yeah. I think that um, it's even more exciting when you're generating regular, controlled, sustainable cash flow by mm -hmm. doing something that's adding value to the world that is business focused, that isn't trading or isn't something that's outside of your your control because of the markets yeah. um, and being able to just accumulate. Like I think for the, if you were to just say to me for the average person, like what yeah. is a brilliant method to be financially self-reliant and probably end mm -hmm. up pretty darn wealthy would be mm -hmm. learn to generate income with a digital business. And if I was to go back and give myself advice, I mean, I'm 42 now. And if I was to go back, I don't know, 20 years, 22, I think at 22, I was making about 60 grand a year or something. Um, oh my goodness, how cool is it to have something exciting like Bitcoin to quickly throw your money into so that you don't, I don't know, develop savings or something that's easy to spend for, for 10 years, as I would have like, literal personal bank balances at hundreds of thousands business accounts mm. of millions it was so easy mm. to just go and what will i do spend the money here go buy this go do this whereas yeah. now i just love the fact that i i like to keep personal income is pretty low like a few grand and then take what i take and just stuff it into certain asset classes and for me it's not just yeah. bitcoin I, I probably did say yeah. that that was like my main focus but uh, etfs i've got quite a lot of tesla stock um, but, you know, we have that world now, eToro or Robinhood, yeah. where we can very Easy. easily um, put money into, you know, investment opportunities or stocks or Bitcoin or other asset classes far easier than what it was for, say, our parents' generation. Um, and it's automated. The US. My, my payment yeah. goes from my bank to the exchange to the just, it's just auto automatic. I don't have to think about it. Like, it's just... yeah. Whether it's an ETF, I don't do ETFs. I probably will eventually, like diversify. But I'm I'm big on Bitcoin. But yeah, it's that it's the value system that married up with it. But just I'm so glad you wrapped it up like that that way because I've often said to a lot of my friends in the Bitcoin space who are very much grinding away in a job they're not passionate about, and it's like, okay, well let's just assume that Bitcoin does fix everything and money is fixed and we're living your your, your great 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 grandchildren living in that world where it is money what are you doing? Because, okay, we might not live to see that, but that's what I'm trying to operate on. I'm like, I'll be a voice for it for sure. But I've had to go through that journey myself. Like you've just said, you know, sitting in, sitting in front of a screen all day, watching the volatility, having sleepless nights about it. But now I'm at this point where I'm like, oh, this is great. But it, it's taken that. It's the not quitting yeah. thing again. It's like, I believe in this, but I can't have it consuming me quite so much. And I've met some incredible people and I will continue to be a voice for it but there's still a lot of people there that are kind of missing the point that life is happening now. Yeah. I think the reflection point I'd encourage these sort of people with these mentalities uh, to have is, um, okay, let's say that suddenly your Bitcoin, your 10 Bitcoin or whatever, five Bitcoin, one Bitcoin, 20, whatever Bitcoin yeah. is suddenly worth, you know, a million a coin and you've mm -hmm. got more money than you'd ever need. Like, how would it change your life? How would you be spending your time? And now if they say, like, I'd be obsessing over the price of Bitcoin, then fair enough. But not many people yeah. can say that. No, <laughs> you exactly. Know? Um, so they're, they're, it's really no different to somebody working in a career saying one day I'll be able to retire. The, the answer is much more likely, hey, you could probably make a lot more money. You could probably find something that you're a lot more passionate about. It could be even more exciting because you're going to be accumulating a ton more Bitcoin. Like for me right now, it's really challenging not to put every spare cent into Bitcoin right now because of the timing. You know, I didn't feel that a year ago. I didn't feel that two years ago, but it's pretty obvious with the incoming ETF being looking likely uh, when you've got people uh, like Larry Fink saying that Bitcoin is very real um, and yeah. is a good hedge. 
um, it's very difficult not to sort of think, hmm, like this is a once in a lifetime. I need more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, the, and the easiest way to do that is to earn shit tons of money if that's something yeah. that's a motivator for you. You know, and I, I think that, that business gives you a lot more control than some external market that we don't have the ability to to really influence in any matter or form whatsoever. Bitcoin goes to zero tomorrow, like you know, it, it's it's done. Like it, it, yeah. you know, or Bitcoin goes to a million tomorrow, like wh yeah. whatever happens is completely out of our control. Is the point? Yeah. And so again, it's yeah. the same message whether they're in the Bitcoin community or anything else. Like, how do you want to spend your time? How can you lead mm. by example? How can you create a wake of value in, in, in the way that you're living your life? Like you said, it could be outdoor, more outdoor adventures. It could be an example to families getting kids off technology. It could be um, online business. It could be money. It could be Bitcoin. It could be investing. It could be whatever. Yeah, like It could be an education business. It could be an e-commerce business. It could be a coaching business. But as long as it's aligned with how you'd spend your time anyway, but I can genuinely say, like I run a multi-million uh, business, um, and I can genuinely say like, I spend every single day, every day, pretty much, obviously I have responsibilities, but they're responsibilities I've chosen around my team doing this anyway. Like I, I, somebody asked me the other day, like if you had infinite, unlimited amounts of access to your funds, like how would you spend your time? I think the only thing I might change would be spending more time in younger audiences talking opportunity and business and education, but doing what I'm doing now, but rather than to people like you and I and people in the corporate world, I'd probably go a little bit younger and spend more time in schools, which I'm sure I'll do anyway. In fact, mm. it's probably a bit of an excuse that I don't do it. I've got the time to do it. But I really wouldn't make that many differences. My lifestyle, where I live, the house I live in, um, like nothing's really going to change at this point. And so I think, you yeah. know, the earlier you can find that sort of wake of value that you're creating, leading by example, earning multiple income streams potentially um, from the mm. different things that you're doing, the better. And that's how you create an authentic brand. If you want a brand, a brand doesn't mean social media influencer. It doesn't mean tons of followers. It could be an email yeah. list. It could be a private community. As you know, I don't put myself much out on social at all. Um, I have email lists. I have private community. I have customers, mm. clients. Most of my customer acquisition is paid traffic or affiliates. Um, you can build it your way. And 100%. And there's faceless brands. That's something I'm trying to um, get creators who aren't the face of their brand. Like there's um there's a little animation called It's Lenny. Have you seen It's Lenny on Instagram? No. It's a blob. It's an animated blob that just like does yeah. 30 second animations going, hey, I'm just checking in to let you know you're amazing. It's like a mental health. I mean, the, the sponsorships a brand like that must have had around or could have around mental health. Um. So I'm trying to I'm trying yeah. to find a few more like that at the moment. I think um, something we're noticing at launch you is you said something earlier about, you know, is skepticism sort of falling away. It's definitely nowhere near what it was when I started in 08. Um, yeah. What we're seeing, the trend we're seeing is now people having to upskill and reskill out. They've yeah. got no they've, they've put in the job applications. There aren't the jobs. They're in careers where they know that it's changing so rapidly that they're next, you know. And so um, I don't know how it's going to change the dynamic. One of the concerns I've had is that when you've got a community of dreamers and doers who believe dreams are worth chasing and they're doing it for that reason, that is a different me mentality than I'm being forced to learn something yeah. new and coming at it from a place of fear and scarcity. Um, so, you know, we're definitely seeing a lot more people having, so I would say just get ahead of the curve. Like, you know, AI is rapidly changing uh, the way that things are done. Um, you have it as a, an amazing, incredible tool to create tons of leverage, to close skills gaps, uh, to support you in the areas you might not be confident in. No different mm. to years ago, uh, let's say the first bike was how can we put human energy and make ourselves be more efficient and go faster? Along comes um, a calculator, this little tool that suddenly those that can't do long multiplications in their head could become mm -hmm. accountants because of this tool and spreadsheets. Like it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a massive skills gap closer. Um, so if you bring creativity, uh, meaning uh, a mission that's important to you, desire to be of value, you've got this incredible tool, whether mm -hmm. it's ChatGPT or all the other AIs that are coming along to help support you do what you do. And businesses, mm. mark my words, the way that they are gonna be operating is we, we, need, we need less staff who are more tech proficient. 
you know, this one person is now equivalent to a team of 10 because of AI. And the person that's yeah. going to be in charge of that department is the one that is taking on the initiative to learn how to use these tools, you mm. know? And so you've got a choice. You could do that in a corporation. I've got employees in my, uh, in my world who say, I would way rather work for you as the visionary, um, as the, the company that's building um, and, and bring a ton of value to that vision because it's aligned with my own values and purpose. Yeah. And there are people that are like, hey, I'm going to go off and do my own thing. But I would certainly encourage you to think more entrepreneurial, whether that's as an entrepreneur, getting into small, more dynamic companies, or whether it's building your own is really where the future is. Um, these oil tankers that take years to sign anything off and have red tape. I mean, I, ju I just don't see a prosperous future for anyone involved. No. On that note, you've already answered the questions I would normally ask, like, what would you tell your younger self? You've done all that, cross those ones off. So I guess the only question left, which I wrote down for you, which I think I know your answer would be, who's going to win when Elon and Zuck have their fight? Oh, um, look, I would probably put my money on Zuck. Um, not that I would want it to be oh, really? Zuck. But yeah, uh, look, Elon's a big guy. He's a heavy guy, um, but he's had back operations. Um, I don't think he's anywhere near as fit, anywhere near as fit as Zuck. Um, I think but. that, you know, he, pretty obvious he's he's tired a lot of the time. Um, but, you know, I'm much more of a fanboy, if you like, of of Elon mm. and his visions um, and his yeah. ways of, of doing things. Fair enough. That was kind of a tongue in cheek question. I wrote it in my brain dump of notes a while ago, but I, I wouldn't <laughs> even know if they'd done it, to be honest. I just know it blew up on Twitter. I don't think it will like, happen. Oh, guys, I, really? I, I haven't followed up. Yeah, I've not kept up to date, but I doubt it will happen. You know, I think, I mean, it, it would only take one more back injury for for, for Elon. He'll probably get sued by his own shareholders for even entertaining the idea. <laughs> Paralysis. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> Well, on that note, thank you so much for making the time. It was a long overdue catch up. Maybe we can carry on talking. But um, thank you for changing my life and many others. Oh, and no. thank you for still being here because a lot of the people I'm seeing, the younger generation of the creator space or the creator gurus now, like I've even bought some of their courses just to see what they're doing. And they're one thing onto the next, onto the next, onto the next. And for you to still be here 10 years or 15 years later, preaching exactly the same thing, I think is just, it's got so much substance. And I think it's something people considering any kind of mentorship or investment in new skill sets, new business, whatever, take it seriously, because there's not many around who have been around as long as yeah. you. That's fair, right? Well, look, I mean, just to finish up on that, it's very common for creators to cause burnout. And I tell you now, they say yes too much it's, yeah. it's as simple as that yes to every social media platform yes to every podcast yes to every interview yes to every seminar yes to every speaking engagement they burn out um mm -hmm. it's i've seen that time and time again and what's yeah. enabled us to be so sustainable truly has been top down and it's not just me it's yeah. the board our mentality of being very clear on our lane and staying within it yeah um yeah but yeah Thank you. I'm going to hit the stop on the recording now and we can carry on chatting if that's the case. It's an hour and a half. It's going to be a nightmare to edit, but love your work. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, look at you, you legend, getting all the way to the end. Thank you so much for listening to this very special episode. I hope you enjoyed all those truth bombs. I certainly did. And as someone who has invested close to a quarter of a million dollars in the last decade in my own mentoring, coaching courses, that kind of thing, I can tell you hand on heart that Stuart Ross is still the guy I credit the majority of my financial and personal success to. He just changed my thinking at a very important time in my life. So don't forget to grab all the extras and listener bonuses that I mentioned at the start of this episode, including an eight minute, very handy highlight reel. If you need a little motivational pick me up anytime, it's all in one very easy to remember place. BUgetpaid.com forward slash Stuart. That's S-T-U-A-R-T. BUgetpaid.com forward slash Stuart. And as always, I love getting your feedback. So tag or message me on social media using at Amy Taylor says or flick me an email at amy at bugetpaid.com. And links to all of that will be in the show notes or the description wherever you're listening. Thank you again for being here and supporting these conversations with creators in my mission to help as many people as possible know themselves, know money and be happy. See you next time.